Well, welcome to Keynotes from Cornell University. On today's episode, we're discussing how AI is being used as part of the creative process in writing storytelling with Professor Christopher Byrne from the Department of Communication. Professor Byrne is also the faculty author of the online brand storytelling certificate program here at Cornell University. Professor Byrne, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us in studio today. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's good to be on South Hill. So great to have you. So I really (laughs) want to kind of baseline our conversation today. So what makes a good story? That's a big question. A question that you could write a book on, I suppose. I think for me and what I try to get across in my courses is a good story will at least open a mind, if not change a mind. It'll get the audience to look at something a little bit differently than they had. And then maybe change behavior, maybe like approach life differently as a result. And it does it in an entertaining way. No one likes being lectured to. We want the story to be entertaining, but we also want it to like affect us in a meaningful way. And when you're talking about that emotional connection, what's something you tell your students or have your students think about when they're thinking about writing a story? I tell the students, um, and this is something that I I believe in that the most effective stories are human interest stories. And so I try to have them, I mean, there's many different ways to tell stories, but I think an effective way is to have it to be character driven. So you start with character and you tell a story about a, a person or an animal. And then from that series of conflicts, plot setting, a theme will arise. And typically People tend to look at theme first, like they want to do a story around a theme. And what I'm trying to encourage students to do is think about like character first, tell a story about a person um, who is like trying to do something and something is preventing them from accomplishing that. And do you find that the theme typically comes out once they have their character set? I think the theme like arises slowly throughout the narrative and by the end of the story, there should be an understanding of what the main idea was. And there are often more than one theme in a story. But by the end of the story, when the movie's over, that's when you're realizing, oh, that was about this. This was, this was, this was revealing um, this about, about life. Well, how has storytelling changed over time? Really, the basic elements of storytelling haven't changed in terms of like character, a plot, a conflict or a series of conflicts preventing the hero from accomplishing their goal, their mission around setting, around themes. But storytelling has been around as long as we have, or as long as we become Homo sapiens, 70,000 BC is really when we started like telling stories in a way that could be more fiction than maybe even nonfiction mythology, for example. And so it was an oral tradition. Gutenberg changed that in the 15th century when we started printing things. And then technology grew into sound, into film, and then into all the wonderful stuff that we have right now. But, you know, if you look at storytelling today compared to storytelling with the Greeks, for example, it hasn't really changed that much. What has changed is the platforms, the ability to maybe integrate images. Um, But, you know, paintings tell stories, music tells stories, and they always have. But now we can have like combination of those with with machines now helping us tell those stories. And you actually just stole my next question was mm-hmm. how does technology affect our storytelling? So mm-hmm. I'm thinking about telling a story on a movie versus in a book. How has the technology changed the way we tell stories? I think it allows us to collaborate more. So with technology, we look at like bringing in others who can add their craft to it and that can make the story a little bit more interesting. You know, it's always been a collaborative effort. If you look at like children's books, there's the author, but then there's usually the illustrator that like can add to it as well too. So technology can bring in another perspective to it, can add another dimension to it that can make it interesting. It can kind of colorize it or it can, it can add a dimension to it. But really the essence of the stories remain the same. I mean, you know, you could go back to Shakespeare and, you know, we could do something with that now, but it's still Shakespeare. It's still what he had an idea of back in the 1600s. How have you had to adapt the way you're teaching when it comes to storytelling and the different technology that has arisen over the last decade or so? 
let's think about audio, for example, and the growth of podcasts in the past really 15 years, and maybe even closer to that, maybe like 10 years in podcasts become. So what is it that you can do with sound that you can't or can't do with video or the spoken word? One of the great things about sound, about podcasts, is that your audience can be multitasking. They usually are multitasking. Very rarely does someone sit down in their podcast chair, mm-hmm. uh, except for me, and listen to the podcast. They're usually working out, folding laundry, driving a car. So they're a little bit distracted. So sometimes you need to be a little bit more explicit with podcasts. Then you bring in video to that and you have a little bit more of an audience that needs to focus on the screen. (laughs) And there are certainly things you can add visually to the story that can add to it. You can have a story told without sound or with music. You could argue that our attention spans have gotten shorter Mm -hmm. and that's certainly the case. Um, So when you're thinking about like, and there's also a lot more out there and available. So we won't be as patient. So I think brevity is probably something that you want to teach. But then there's also this really interesting growth of long form journalism. You know, there's this real growth recently of like, we need more to the story, right? These little snippets that we're getting are only giving us the surface. So there's the hope that maybe long form is happening too, but it's, you know, undoubtedly a shorter attention span. So being able to tell a story in a short story format or a short, short story format is a challenge, but it's a good challenge to have. Are there certain platforms that just naturally lend itself to drawing that emotional connection easier? So for example, a movie, or like you mentioned, a podcast, having that kind of audio cue, are there certain platforms that lend itself just naturally to that emotional connection? I think so. I mean, I'm a huge fan of podcasts as, as, as are you, but The reason why is because there's something about the human voice that is very soothing. There's a reason why, you know, we read to our young children at night before they go to bed, because the sound of the caregiver's voice is like relaxing. It it builds trust. It's very soothing. And, you know, we listen to our, our radios at night before we go to sleep and we wake up in the morning and we listen to the news. We listen to, you know, whatever we're hearing in in the in the morning as we prepare for the day. And I think it gives us a sense of, of comfort. The human voice is, is warm and reassuring, and we can take it with us while we do other things. So that's part of the reason why I think podcasts have done so well, maybe because we're busy, but we also like, we want to hear voices and we don't want to be, we don't want to be toggled to a screen more than we, ha- more than we have to. So I think that explains like the success of podcasts or audio in general. Have people's attention spans shortened up over time, or have you found that your students' attention spans oh, have absolutely. shortened up over time? Sure, absolutely. I mean, anyone who has been in education for any period of time would would say that. I've always used the age to minutes ratio. So when you're teaching uh, middle school, you probably have them for about like 10 to 12 minutes uh-huh. on one thing. When you get to high school, maybe 14 to 15 minutes. Now I teach at the university level, so I can talk about something for about 20 minutes. And then after that, they're gone. I have to change the activity. So, um, yeah, the attention span has gone down and it presents, I mean, it's a problem, sure, but it also is a good challenge because no one wants to drone on. The stories usually do go on too long and you should change up activities. You shouldn't be talking about anything too long. So when I'm trying to teach editing, which is a big part of storytelling, I encourage them to like cut, cut, cut. You'll be surprised at how much the story is still going to work even when you've chopped it up a little bit. So that 30 minute conversation could easily be an 11 minute conversation. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing I learned when I was working in the news business was I would have, you know, these long interviews and my news director would be like, all right, you only got about a minute and a half right. for your package. Right. And it's like trying to fit the B-roll and everything right. in there. It was, it was a lot. But while we're talking a little bit about technology, there was an influencer, I believe maybe last year who made news and then another gentleman who made news in, I think his profession was law and they- yeah essentially had used technology to write their term papers or something like that. Just looking at it from 3,000 miles up, what are some ways AI is being used when it comes to storytelling nowadays? It's definitely being used for storytelling. I think, you know, when it comes to using AI to write a paper for school or taking an exam, there's certainly academic integrity issues around, but there's academic integrity issues around any type of new technology. Once we switched, once we pivoted to um, having our uh, exams online, we now had the availability of Google. So we had to trust the students wouldn't be um, using it. So this is now another tool for students to have if they choose to do it. And I think the 
instructor needs to be very explicit about whether they can do it or not. They maybe even sign a contract saying you're not going to use AI for this assignment, or maybe you can use AI as a collaboration for this exam. In terms of storytelling, you know, once you get into creativity, AI is not quite there yet. Uh, I'm going out on a limb and saying that uh, where we are with ChatGPT, um, 3.5, which is what most of us are using because it's free. You can find free 4.0 uh, if you use Bing, but most of us are on the 3.5. and Because I think they're, they eventually want us to get to pay for it. The stories that they would create on ChatGPT are like really good middle school stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't say that despairingly on uh, middle school, but ChatGPT is in its infancy. It's really been not even a year since it was introduced to us. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it may, they, they brought it out to the public last March. It's still very young. And so it's not quite like being able to find the human feelings, the human emotions, what, they're, what we're finding with our use of ChatGPT 3.5, 4 is a little bit different in terms of storytelling is a lot of cliches, a lot of stereotypes, almost cringy. If you're going to use ChatGPT to use a story, to write a story on its own, you're going to have something that's going to be like rather bland. If you want to then collaborate with it and change it and kind of use it as a base, then maybe it's something. But I wouldn't like trust AI or ChatGPT at this point to you to be your only creative output. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned a little bit earlier when we started about you tell your students to write impactful stories. Yeah. Would you be able to tell a difference if somebody did it through chat GPT or if they like old school physically wrote it out? I mean, it depends on how well you know your students. Um, you know, uh, we have a wonderful diverse group and they come from different backgrounds and not everyone is a strong writer. Not everyone thinks uh, creatively. You know, you have like a lot of STEM students who think that way. And when it comes to writing creative stories, they're, it's challenging for them. I think by the time you get to college, you should be writing at a certain level. And that's not just like mechanics, but that's also like, you know, creativity themes. When you have an assignment to write a, a story, you approach it that way and you know what you have to do. And you know that it's based on like truth, authenticity, of human feelings and emotions that bring on vulnerability, that bring on all these things that, that we think about when we think of creative writing, that if it's left to the machine and, and chat GPT is a machine, it's artificial, that's not quite sentient yet. I know there are some that say it has reached sentience, but I don't think it's quite there yet. It's not quite going to do it. It's going to give you something that seems uh, was very basic and cliched. Yeah, it sounds like the technology can't replace that human element for sure. No, no. And, uh, and maybe it will. I mean, the thing is it's new and it's moving very quickly. And three years from now, we'll be in a much different place and it will probably uh, do that. But here's the thing about creativity in, in the human mind is it's, it's wonderfully illogical. It's oftentimes based on mistakes. A lot of great creative ideas have come from mistakes before, like whether it's a musician tuning something differently, whether it's an artist who spilt some paint or a writer who was like trying something and went somewhere. And so that type of like illogical approach to looking at the world is really a wonderful creative output. And the machine is not going to be illogical. The machine is trained to be logical. The it's not trained to make mistakes. So we are wonderfully flawed. And the machines are not flawed. <laughs> That's perfect. I love that. Wonderfully flawed. I'll remember that one. What are some things you're hearing as far as AI being used in the writing of show scripts or entire movies? You touched on that a little bit with yeah. uh, film adaptation earlier. The studios will always, or any type of producer, will want to replace human labor with a machine when they can. I mean, machines don't ask for days off. Machines don't go to rehab. Machines don't look for work-life balance. Machines, you tell them what to do and they, and they do it. They're the ideal worker. But they're not necessarily turning out quality work right now. Now, the, the important thing to think about too is where AI is right now. As I said, it's in its infancy. And if you think about like where television was in its infancy back in the 1950s, television in the early 1950s was not very good. Most of the stuff you were seeing was like a talking uh, horse 
leave it to beaver. It was not the high point of culture. It was what Newton Minow famously called the vast wasteland. It took about, you know, the 70s and the 80s. By the 90s, television was getting good. But television in its infancy was not good. AI in its infancy is, is not very good, but it will. It'll, it'll go faster than three decades. It'll, set, it'll certainly move much faster at that. So right now, ChatGPT could turn out a script for a sitcom that could be like, not the high point of culture, you know, the lowest common denominator. It could turn in a decent sitcom. But, you know, if you think about most of the sitcoms you see on television, most of them are not really very good. Uh, there are some that are excellent. So it could do a decent job at that. What I think it could do was work as a collaborator. So for a writing room that in the old days had six or seven writers sitting around a table, you could now have one or two writers sitting around a table and a computer, and the computer is turning out a draft or the computer is doing some research on it. So you've cut down on, on the amount of labor in the room, which is bad for the writers because there's now three writers without work. But will they be replaced by the writers? No, I don't think a computer will ever replace a writer completely but it'll certainly cut down on the number of writers. So is it safe to say we can use AI as kind of support? Because I'm thinking yeah. about writing a show script for a series and yeah. to try to get all the, uh, you know, all those small little details and the intricacies of all the different things that happen in 10, 12 episodes. I don't think a, a computer could do that. So is it safe to say that, you know, maybe writers should use AI to help support their writing or yeah. kind of give them a broad idea? Yeah, I think AI can be a really helpful collaborator. And as I've said, storytelling has always been interactive, which means it's not just between the storyteller and the audience, but it's the storyteller and the illustrator, the storyteller and the sound designer, the storyteller and the, uh, the cinematographer. So it's collaborative. So now we have another collaborator to come in and help out with things like the heavy lifting of, of research, you know, you want to write a, a script that takes place during the Vietnam War. So I could read a book or four books on the Vietnam War, or I could have ChatGPT give me some specific information about a specific battle. And all of a sudden, and then with ChatGPT 4.0, it could give me an image of what that battle looked like. And six hours of research was just cut down to about a minute of ChatGPT giving me the information that I need so that I can start writing the scene that takes place in, in Vietnam and make it authentic. But I think it's important to mention that I don't think the writers will ever be replaced by computers, correct? I don't think so, but you know, who? I mean, we're getting into the science fiction now. I mean, humans will, will humans be replaced by machines eventually? I know, I'm just thinking about the Matrix, but I can only imagine watching a new season of The Office or the, a new season of South Park where it's like, it was just written in chat, GPT. I can only yeah. imagine what it would be like. In the sports industry, I, I teach a sports communication class as well, too. And, um, you know, sports journalism is one of the, the professions that's being threatened by AI because sports leads itself really well to, like, you know, giant pieces of data that have to be uh, analyzed. So what we've seen in uh, the recent Wimbledon or the U.S. Open is Wimbledon in the, the Masters Tournament in golf, which was presented by IBM and Watson. They actually had AI broadcasters. So if you go on to, not live, but if you go on to the, the website and you look back at some of the, the highlights of the, the Masters Tournament and Wimbledon, the announcers are, are computer-generated voices. Because their voices for golf and tennis are very like calm and soothing, yeah. like they're never going to replace Tony Romo in football because they yes, want those big, goofy no. guys. Yes. <laughs> but with something like tennis and golf, when they need a, a very calm and focused voice, that's happening right now. And so the scripts that they have for these shows, if you need all of a sudden the, the stats on a hitter coming up to the plate, ChatGPT can turn that out in a second. So you have an entire crew who had to do all this research on every batter in the American League that is now a click away from AI for you right there. It's all I need is for AI to tell me how bad the Mets played last year. <laughs> you don't need Great. AI for that. I, no, I can only imagine <laughs> While we're talking a little bit about this, we actually just got a great question in from James. So James checks in and he asks, how will AI change the craft of editing in the decades to come? Showrunner, what kind of jobs does AI do for 
big editing decisions, line editing, or even proofreading processes? Yeah. So for editing, it's absolutely available and it's been being used already for, for editing, for video editing and sound editing. But just like with writing, it's not super creative and good editing needs to be creative. But if you show it something that you want it to look like, if you tell it, if you prompt it to like base it on a certain look, MTV style, it'll replicate that look. It's really good at not being original. If you want that, it'll be, uh, it'll be fine. I wonder if there'll be a point where the AI is sophisticated enough to maybe bring back shows, not obviously from the 50s, because it was kind of a wasteland, I believe you said, <laughs> but maybe some of those old shows from the early 2000s, um, you know, South Park, The Office, some of those shows where, sure. you know, maybe they could give us a rough draft, but then we would have maybe a showrunner or scriptwriter yeah. come in and kind of tweak it a little bit. Yeah. So that was one of the tough points with the WGA and, uh, and SAG too, because we can now do this with images. So Tom Cruise can soon retire and we can still use his image for another Mission Impossible. And he can get a cut of that, right? He can maybe not get his full fee, but he can get a good portion of his fee for his image being used in these movies. So with the screenwriters and the television writers, that was one of their that was one of their talking points because if they do want to revive an older show, typically you would hire writers to come in and put a new twist to this and they're hired and they can make a, a living for a little while. If a machine's going to do it, it's going to be a lot less expensive and maybe less less creative, less less successful. But you know, it all comes down to what the studio wants. You know, and the bottom line for the studio is usually, um, you know, how much money is it making? Cutting out that fee for the, the writers when you turn something out that's okay might be good enough for them. Yeah. There's only so many Mission Impossibles Tom Cruise can make. At some point, he's got to retire. <laughs> he will retire. Yeah. And then they'll continue using his image and people will still go see it. I know? know. I'm thinking Mission Impossible and the James Bond movies. There's so right. many James Bond movies. It's like, at some point, Daniel Craig, it's like, he's yeah, too old for this. <laughs> but, you know, now that we're thinking a little bit about how AI is helping us write scripts and shows and things, what are some ways AI can help when it comes to are writing just generally, not yeah. script focused, but say writing a short form article or right. maybe like a long form novella. Yeah, absolutely research, which is really helpful. It's also really great for mechanics, for grammar and structure. So one thing that ChatGPT is really good for um, in education or English as a second language, ESL students who are like struggling with like the mechanics of run on sentence, verb tense. ChatGPT is really good for that. I mean, we have Grammarly too that'll happen, but ChatGPT will make it even smoother. So, you know, I compare it to the introduction of the calculator to the classroom, probably back in the 50s or 60s, you know, when all of a sudden we have this new tool and I'm sure there were math teachers all around that were freaking out about their jobs being over because now who's going to, there's no reason to teach them the multiplication tables, but it didn't stop math from happening. In fact, it maybe brought math to a higher level so they didn't have to worry about memorizing the multiplication tables. They could actually think about big concepts and big ideas. So with the possibility of AI eliminating the problems of like where to put a semicolon or the proper use of a, of a comma or a run-on sentence, now they can be thinking of like bigger things like the content, like the story, and then the, the, the grammar will kind of fill in for itself. Now, there are some that'll argue that we're losing out by losing all those rules, but I mean, did we lose out with the calculator? Are we, are we worse at math now because we have the calculator? I don't even, anyone thinks that anymore. I mean, there used to be teachers who banned the calculator from the classroom. Now they require the calculator in the classroom. You have to have that Texas instrument type of computer, um, type of calculator for your class. And it'll probably be the case with AI too. At, uh, in my classes now in the Department of Communication, we actually get Grammarly for the students and we don't require it, but we strongly encourage them to use Grammarly before they turn in a paper because I don't want to spend time correcting grammar when you have this program that can fix it for you. So I want to be looking at other things besides your mechanics. And a big thing with chat GPT, obviously, is making sure you have the right prompts. What are some ways we can think about the prompts and yeah. what are some ways we should think about, okay, I'm trying to write a movie treatment or I'm trying to write a long form paper, how do we know what are the right prompts right. to enter? Yeah. So the prompts are going to be key. The key to any successful collaboration with AI or specifically chat GPT is asking the right uh, directions of it, giving it the right prompt. 
the more specific you can be, <laughs> the better. Now, the first version of ChatGPT only took us up to like 2021, and there's a lot of things that have happened since then. So I think 4.0 uh, or even 4.5, which hasn't come out yet, will make it like completely current. So being able to like guide it through specifics of what you're looking for in terms of like a specific setting, a, spe a specific type of character, a specific problem that they can build around, just like you would collaborate. Like if you and I were collaborating on a script together, we would start off by having a conversation. Like what's this going to be about? Where should it take place? Who should these characters be? Like what motivates this character? What was his childhood like? What's his relationships like? And those are all things that you would be able to prompt chat GPT into turning something out. Then it becomes a matter of drafts, right? Chat GPT gives you something really quickly, like within seconds. And then you look at it and you read it over and then you make adjustments as you would like, okay, so this needs a little bit of work. So let's try to tweak this and give it back to it. So it's basically a collaboration with a machine, just like you collaborate with a human, but the human collaboration is about questions that we're mm -hmm. asking each other. And those are in the form of prompts for the, for the machine. And does that carry over to other forms of writing? So I'm thinking, for instance, with my news background, all the millions of press releases I read, yeah. does that translate over to writing maybe a press release, knowing exactly what prompts to put in and getting a somewhat rough yeah. draft of a press release? Yeah. So a press release is a great thing for ChatGPT to do, and I'm sure many people are using it. It doesn't take a lot of time, and someone who writes a press release does it often enough where they can do it fairly quickly. And we probably have templates as we, as we use anyway. But I think with, with ChatGPT, the speed at which it can be done. So, you know, if you write a good press release, and you, even if you've been doing it for a long time, it's going to take you, you know, a half an hour or so to construct it and everything that this is something that ChatGPT could probably do in about a minute. And then maybe you'll look at it and make a few notes and then, so it's maybe five minutes. So you probably could have done five other things during that time it took to create the one press release. But a press release is a good example of something ChatGPT can do really well. It's not looking for anything super creative. It's looking for like a certain amount of information that has to come out in a certain way. You want to have a good image attached to it as well. You want to have a, a catchy hot headline, a good lead. So journalism, specifically sports journalism, as I said, was something that ChatGPT could do. Because if you look at like, traditional journalism, it's not really creative writing. It's like, here's the information that we need to get to them and here's how we do it. And here's the structure of doing it. Like, and so you can feed it the information. Here's what was said at the press conference. Here's the number, here are the dates, create a 500 word story with this image and it'll, it'll create that. And when we're thinking about using chat GPT to write some things, and I'm sure some of the folks out there in the audience have used it, what are some things we should be cognizant about when we get that version back from that AI program, if it is chat GPT? Yeah. We should be cognizant of bias, right? We should be cognizant of copyright. Like where did it get this from? I mean, what chat GPT is doing is it's a machine that's following instructions. Uh, you're giving it a prompt and then it's going into a database, a massive trillions and trillion sized database and then pulling out the stuff that's already been there that does not belong to you. It belongs to somebody else. So it's not coming up with anything original. And we could argue that there's very few original plots anyway, but still someone else has had those ideas out there that it's essentially like borrowing or maybe even stealing from. So we should be aware of that. And we should also be aware of of the, the human element of things like, you know, is this something that, that another human can identify with because machines don't understand humans, humans understand humans. Rachel asked checks in with another great question. And Rachel asks along this line, she asks, I feel like consumers should have the right to know if content is generated by AI yeah. so we can make our own decisions as to whether or not we engage with that content, uh, showrunner suggestion. Yeah. What's been done to verify, label, or qualify AI-generated content? Yeah, that's a good question. So you, we can cite AI, just as you would cite anything. So if, for example, you use part of your whatever it is that you're writing, your essay, your story, your research paper that has been found on AI, there's a citable way of saying this was found through ChatGPT and then whatever it found through ChatGPT. So 
like we would use citations for anything else that we're borrowing, we can definitely acknowledge that we found this using ChatGPT. You know, in, in education, there's a special challenge with academic in, integrity. And I think the, the, um, the, the smart instructors are not running away from it. They're actually embracing it, just like the calculator and the math teachers who like, you know, doom and gloom. So there are assignments that the students are allowed or even encouraged to use AI, as I've used in my class. And then there are assignments that they are explicitly told not to use AI or not to use ChatGPT. And if they break those rules, they break the rules. That's academic integrity, and that can become a whole other thing. One thing that we have found that does not work yet <laughs> is any type of detection device. The Turnitin software, for example, which worked pretty good for plagiarism. But one thing that we've discovered at, at Cornell is like, don't try to uh, use the software. There's plenty of it, like chat GP0 or something. First of all, it's not good. And second of all, you don't want to be in the position where you're like assuming, you don't want to accuse a student of using something that they haven't used. It's, it's not worth it. So I think the understanding is just to be clear from the beginning, you can put it in your syllabus or you can talk about it on day one. And this could be even around the writer's room too, about like, okay, so what's going to be our relationship with AI in this class? And I'm going to tell you when you can use it and tell you when you can't use it. And then we'll take it from there. And if you do use it, then you have to acknowledge that you use this. And I'm wondering, how do we start those conversations? I know at least in the world of academia, it's yeah. very slow moving and everything like that. So how do we have those conversations where we say, this is the wave of the future, essentially. Yeah. I mean, the conversations are happening everywhere on, on college campuses, and I'm assuming high school and middle school, because I think their challenges are even bigger. Because as I said, they're writing at a pretty good middle school level. So if I was a high school English teacher right now, I would be having a meeting or two <laughs> about what we're going to do with this, because it's absolutely something that can be used. Um, you know, college admissions is looking at like the college admissions essay, which is perfect for that, as is the best man speech at a wedding. Ask ChatGPT to do that, and it's like, boom, and you don't care about the cliches because that's all, that's all it is, is, is a cliche. So the conversation is happening everywhere. I feel like every meeting I'm at at Cornell, AI comes up because there are professors that are terrified. There are professors, especially in STEM, that embrace it. And then there are questions about policy, like, should we have a policy? And we do have a page where we put it out there, and it's basically up to the instructor as it should be. And I think it usually begins in the syllabus because that's the first thing that you have, that first thing the student looks at when they're considering the course. And as you would have in any syllabus and academic integrity section, within that academic integrity section is what your policy is on the use of AI in the classroom. And on mine, I acknowledge that it's out there and it's available and there are some assignments that we can use it and there are some assignments that we can't use it. And if you decide to cross that line, it's just like cheating on an exam or plagiarizing on a, on a paper you might get away with it. I don't think it's going to benefit you very much if you do get away with it. I mean, you can certainly cheat your way through anything if you'd like, but you're paying a lot of money to come here. So hopefully you'd want to get something out of it. But I think the key is to, like any type of technology, is to, is to look at it as something that is going to be beneficial more than being cynical. I'm going to ask you a little bit about your course, um, but I want to get to this last audience question. Yeah. Miria checks in and she asks, storytelling is inspired, I imagine, by inspiration and imagination. Would you say AI will lessen a person's imagination? In other words, will AI create a generation of storytellers with less imagination or more? Oh, that's so sad. I hope it doesn't take away our imagination. I think imagination is human. <laughs> I'm not sure how imaginative a computer can be yet. As I said, it all comes down to being sentient, I suppose. A computer responds to commands. And can you be imaginative on command? I don't think so. I think the whole purpose, the whole idea of imagination is it's like free and open and it goes somewhere, it goes to dangerous places. It goes to like weird places. It goes to fun places. I would hope that imagination remains intact for the, the human experience. And maybe even if we can kind of take away from some of these restrictions of like the mechanics of writing. For example, if you are an English language learner, or let's say you're just not really good at like grammar 
because you didn't care about it much in school. And when it comes time to write a story, you might not be so like enthusiastic about writing that story because you're worried about your spelling and your grammar. With that out of the picture now, because we know that AI can take care of that, maybe we can now focus on like true imagination without worrying about the rules around it. I'm thinking of uh, Inception and like general yeah. inspiration. I'm getting that line from Leo DiCaprio out there. <laughs> but very quickly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your brand storytelling certificate program. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about it. Who should kind of take the course? Brand storytelling is for anyone who is interested in either their own personal brand. And we now know just really began in the 1990s when we started seeing ourselves as a brand, as a way to like market ourselves as free agents, not necessarily like coming out of college and working for General Electric entire, until you retire. We now know that we can bounce around from place to place. And we usually do. We bounce around from job to job and career to career. So what do we have to offer? any organization, whether it's a nonprofit or it's IBM, what do we have to offer? Are we STEM? Are we good at math? Do we have a good sense of humor? Are we a people person? Are we a numbers cruncher, right? So what is it? What are your values? What are your strengths? And then how can you like, I don't like the word market when it comes to like the human condition, but really when you're looking for work, that's what you're doing. So for a personal brand, is how can you like figure out who you are, what you represent, what you have to offer, and then in a sense, like sell it to the world. This is who I am. This is my website. This is my design. This is what I have to offer. And it also goes beyond business too. It goes beyond like your social life, your friend group, your sports team. So there's that. But there's also, you're starting a new business, right? And everyone knows that it's all about brand. <laughs> And everyone knows that like with brand comes like story. So what's your story? And the story could come from, certainly as we talked about in the beginning, like the hero of the story, like the guy who started, the person who started the company. But I think also the conflict, like what was the problem that you saw that needs to be solved that like this thing that you're introducing to the world can be a solution to. So it's character driven, but it's also about a conflict. It's about a setting. So where does this take place? It's about a theme. So what's the theme for your uh, organization, for your company? It's, it's small business, but it's also a nonprofit. You know, it's how to figure out who you are, what you represent, what you have to offer the world, and how you can get it out there through video, through your website, through a podcast. And again, it always seems to go back to storytelling, right? Because we all love storytellers. And we all love good stories. And every idea comes from a creation story, a myth. And those stories will help promote who you are and what you want to give the world. And just very quickly, how can AI help us market ourselves or brand our own story? So I'm thinking somebody trying to write a cover letter or AI can take yeah. all the stuff from a resume and spit out our own story. How can AI help us bring out our own brand? So AI is good at taking a massive data set and then breaking it down to like a summary or like a, a demographic or an outline. So I would save the creative part to like the human, but if I'm looking to like figure out like where these people are, where these groups are, what the needs are, like what, how much water do they need in this part of like Canada, AI could be really good at doing that heavy lifting, like getting those numbers for me, just like we could use Google, right? We could Google it and we could get that information. But what AI will do is they'll now take that Google search, which you probably spent about 15 or 20 minutes on, and it cut it down to like two minutes. So AI will give you that data, will give you that summary, will give that information for you to like turn into something creative. Perfect. Well, Professor Byrne, thank you so much for joining us. I want to wrap with, if you could kind of reach out to our audience and give them one piece of advice or one thing to think about regarding their brand, or maybe they might dip a toe into using chat GPT. What's that one takeaway you would want them to know? Sure. I would say be fearless. Don't be intimidated by technology. Take the time to, to learn it, to experiment with it and look at it as a collaborator. Look at it as a partner. Look at it as something that we can use to create something beautiful together. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us. Audience, thank you so much for listening to us and watching us. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you at the next keynote. Talk to you soon. 
you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes as they're released wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more about honing your storytelling skills or using AI as part of your writing, check out Christopher Byrne's Brand Storytelling Certificate Program. You can also learn about any of Cornell's online courses and on-campus programming by checking out the episode notes for more information. Thank you so much for listening.